<laughs> well, nice to meet you, everyone. Um, thank you for having me here. My name is Kevin Kim, and I'm and I'm an MD PhD student uh, in the Health Research Methodology uh, PhD program. I'm currently in my fourth and hopefully my last year of my PhD. And today I'm going to be presenting uh, my independent study project, which was a scoping review uh, looking into the literature to identify methods of determining the non-impurity margin. Now, I want to thank uh, my co-authors because I'm able to present on behalf of them today, um, but they were really instrumental uh, in helping me uh, get this review going and um, to helping me figure out uh, areas that I am weak in, for example, in statistics. Um, okay, all right. So if we think about um, the conventional uh, superiority trial and we see this confidence interval, we would make the interpretation that there's no significant difference between uh, standard of care and new treatment. But within the setting of a non-impurity trial, we have something called a non-impurity margin, and the same confidence interval would be considered non-inferior. Now, a challenge of, a, of designing a non-impurity trial is that the non-impurity margin is often established by the investigators. And this means that we can have a non-impurity margin that's a bit too liberal, where the investigators have it a bit too easy um, with an imprecise confidence interval to demonstrate non-impurity. And this is this can be reflected by the readers and patients who say, you know, we don't consider this not inferior, that margin isn't really acceptable in clinical practice. But on the other side of that, the non impurity margin could be also too conservative or too strict. And this poses a problem of requiring a super large sample size that may not make the non impurity trial feasible. So the non impurity margin is critical in the design and the analysis and interpretation of non-impurity trials. But how we establish this margin is unclear. If we look at the non-impurity trial and equivalence uh, extension guideline for the consort's uh, statement, um, there really isn't much guidance or, or expectation of how this margin should be set. And the consort guideline basically says you need to specify a margin and provide rationale for its choice. And we don't, they don't say anything else regarding um, what kind of rationale is justified or not. If we also look at ICH E10, which is the International Committee for Har Harmonization, they also say that the accept an acceptable non-impurity margin would, in, would consider and uh, include clinical and statistical considerations. But again, they don't really discuss how these considerations uh, should be incorporated in the non-impurity margin. So given these uncertainties, uh, we decided to conduct a scoping review of the literature to identify methods that are out there that could be used to um, establish the non-impurity margin. Uh, there's two concepts that, I, that underpin uh, the internal validity of a non-impurity trial. The first one is the constancy assumption. And the constancy, constancy assumption um, basically states that the effect of the standard care from the historical placebo trials is equivalent to the effect of standard care that we would anticipate in a non-impurity trial. And this constancy assumption is quite important because as you will see, a lot of our non-impurity margins are derived from historical placebo control trials or just historical trials in general. The second concept is the concept of assay sensitivity, which is the ability to distinguish an effective treatment from a less effective treatment or an ineffective treatment. Um, and this is quite hard within the setting of a non-impurity trial because we're trying to show that to uh, treatments are alike rather than dissimilar. Um, and this is hard because they're relative to each other. So relatively, they could both they could be non-inferior to one another, but it could be that both of them are ineffective um, and they're just kind of relatively similar in its, ineffect in, in its uh, ineffectiveness. Uh, so, so how do we uh, establish assay sensitivity? Well, in a non-impurity trial setting, we establish assay sensitivity by using external evidence. So past placebo trials or past superiority trials demonstrating that the standard of care uh, is superior and therefore effective and effective treatment than doing nothing at all. So in terms of our methods, uh, we researched Medline and Embase from inception to September 2019, and we included studies that discussed methods of establishing the non-impurity margin, uh, their strengths and limitations. We also included studies that referenced methods so that we could 
conduct hand searching uh, to further identify potential papers to include. And we independently and in duplicate conduct a title and an abstract screening, full text review and data extraction. And in terms of what we extracted, it was it was quite simple. We extracted the description of the method. We uh, extracted the strengths and limitations as reported by the authors. Um, unfortunately, due to the methodological nature of our study, um, we cannot assess the risk of bias. Overall, we identified 110 studies um, meeting our inclusion criteria. Um, there were eight statistical methods and three clinical methods. Um, among the statistical methods, there were six frequentists and two Bayesian. Now, today I won't be really discuss. I won't be discussing the Bayesian methods because these are Bayesian uh, variations of the frequentist methods, and they differ from each other, but not drastically, fundamentally. Um, if you have questions, I'll I'll try my best to answer it. Although Bayesian statistics is not my biggest forte. Um, so before we dive into the different types of methods that um, we identified, there is a uh, term that came up uh, during our search and during our extraction, which was a term of discounting. Now, discounting um, means that we're raising the standard of evidence to declare efficacy. Um, and the reason that we do that is because we are accounting for the statistical uncertainty and variances associated with using historical data to then assess and interpret um, the non-impurity of our current non-impurity trial um, in the planning stages, right? So I will be using this term to try and um, uh, exemplify what I mean by discounting. So when we think about the six frequentist methods, um, it's quite easy to group the first three together, the point estimate method, the confidence interval method, and the fixed margin method, because all three of these methods actually uh, use meta-analyses uh, of historical placebo-controlled trials. And what the point estimate method does is it would take the pooled effect estimate and use a preserved fraction of that and use that value as the non-impurity margin. And this basically means that the new treatment should be X percent as good as um, it should at least show X percent of the effect of the standard of care based on historical uh, placebo-controlled trials. The confidence interval method actually takes uh, the lower limit of the confidence interval or the confidence interval that's closest to the null and uses that as the uh, non-inferiority margin. And the fixed margin method, which is quite popular, um, kind of combines these two. And what it basically does is it takes the preserve or it takes a preserved fraction of the lower limit of the confidence interval. And we can see that the fixed margin is quite conservative. So they employ more discounting um, compared to the point estimate and the confidence interval method. Another popular method is the synthesis method. And this is not as visually intuitive as the other three. So I will try my best to explain this. So how the synthesis method declares non-impurity or in is, is technically a non-impurity margin, um, is by implementing the effect estimate from current non-impurity trial, as well as its standard error. And they combine this with the uh, effect estimate, as well as the standard error from historical placebo control trials. So where does the non-impurity margin aspect comes in? Well, it comes in um, in the percentage of preserved or, or the preserved fraction of the effect estimate from the historical placebo control trials. That's for the investigators to decide how much um, we want to preserve of the standard of care to demonstrate non-impurity um, through the synthesis method. The confidence interval-based uh, putative placebo analysis um, constructs uh, demonstrates non-impurity and uh, is a non-impurity margin method by first constructing a confidence interval of the new treatment compared to a putative placebo. Um, what I mean by putative placebo is that it's an indirect comparison. And, and, th and this is something that is alike um, and similar to how we conduct network meta-analyses. So we're able to construct um, a confidence interval and make indirect comparison between the new treatment and the putative placebo due to a common comparator, which in this case is the standard of care. And this confidence interval is compared to a second confidence interval, which is a standard of care compared to the placebo. So these are the historical placebo controlled trials. Now, how do we um, establish non-impurity or how does this technique show non-impurity? Well, 
it would take the lower limit of the first confidence interval and try to demonstrate that it's greater than a preserved fraction of the upper limit of the other confidence interval. So we see that with this technique, not only is there discounting once, there's actually discounting twice in two different areas. Now, the final method is actually kind of a uh, theoretical method and um, it, it's a bit uh, detailed, so I will quickly explain here. So um, the two-stage act con active control testing or the TACT method is a two-stage analysis where you predefine or pre-specify U and L. These are boundaries. Now, at interim analysis, you would compare the event rates of the standard treatment from the historical trials and compare that to the event rates seen in the non-impurity trial. And you compare that with the boundary U. Now, if this difference is greater than U, um, you can assume that the constancy assumption is violated and you do not proceed with hypothesis testing. However, if this difference is less than you, you can proceed to the second stage. So the second stage of analysis happens at the end of the trial. We're conducting the same comparison, the event rates of the standard treatment from the historical compared to the non-impurity trial. Um, but we're comparing this to the boundary L. Now, if the difference is less than the boundary L, we can use the synthesis method or the confidence interval method because we know that the constancy assumption shouldn't have been violated. So we can use more liberal um, methods to test for hypothesis. Now, the reason that I say that it's theoretical is because this technique um, or this method, the authors didn't specify how we should, how investigators should go about establishing this boundary U and establishing the boundary L. Now, in our paper, I can't discuss this uh, all in detail, but in our paper, what we did was uh, we created a table for our readers to be able to see the strengths and limitations that were identified uh, in literature. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have all the, all the uh, references, uh, but a lot of these are commonly quoted um, across different authors and different studies. Uh, but the general takeaway that we got from constructing this table in the data extraction process is that the more discounting that a method employs, for example, such as fixed margin method, the more conservative and the more robust a margin would be against violating the constancy assumption. But in exchange of that, it will be less powerful and it would require a larger sample size to demonstrate non-impurity um, compared to a more liberal technique such as a point estimate or the, syn or the synthesis method that is more powerful and may require less sample to demonstrate the same non-impurity. Now, I also mentioned that we identified three clinical methods. Um, and, these cl and these three clinical methods, Delphi consensus, survey, and minimal clinically important difference uh, were identified in literature uh, that could that as being used in, um, to set the non-impurity margin. And a common strength between all three of these methods is that you do not need historical placebo control trials, um, but they all do have their individual weaknesses. Now with the Delphi consensus method, it's an iterative process, um, and which means that it can be very lengthy. And at the end of a lengthy process, the consensus is not guaranteed. But even if you do reach consensus and establish a margin, um, this margin may not be rep reproducible by future investigators who have a different set of stakeholders that they do this consensus procedure with. Now, the, a weakness of the survey is that um, to, to to establish a robust margin using a survey, um, it requires thoughtful phrasing of questions, it requires good response rate, and it requires a representative sample. So these are not innate to non-impurity margin specifically. This is kind of innate weakness of surveys in general. Um, so it's easier said than done, although it sounds pretty simple to do, um, but that is a weakness. However, it is faster and quicker to administer than the Delphi. The minimal clinically important difference, MCID, or we often call it a uh, minimally important difference as well, um, it allows us to establish a non-impurity margin uh, for patient reported outcomes. Now, the weakness is that we rely on patients to be attentive uh, attentive to full effects of differing treatments. So we would need to study them uh, prospectively because if we ask patients to look back and reflect on some of the different treatments that they're on, then we're kind of introducing recall bias. Um, and another weakness is that intrapatient um, MCID is difficult to measure because it could be influenced by effects beyond efficacy. So for instance, if we're asking patients to assess pain, um, 
pain control, it may be very good, but their satisfaction may be low. And that may not be re related to the pain control, but it could be related to adverse events such as uh, GI upset or stomach issues. And that makes it hard to establish um, a non-impurity margin using MCID. Now, overall, um, I would love to go through this step-by-step uh, step with you, but we, de we developed a conceptual framework um, to kind of synthesize and help readers kind of think about a way to establish a margin. And we developed this uh, to try and incorporate that clinical consideration that ICHD-10 suggests. Um, and through this pathway, you know, um, investigators can kind of narrow down a a, a method that they can use um, that seems the most appropriate for their research question. Now, the, the three things that I wanted to discuss was that the constancy of assumption violation. It's very important that we don't violate the constancy assumption um, because it, it results in an inflation of the type one error rate. But there's no distinctive method out there right now to say that, oh, this trial has um, violated the constancy of assumption or this trial has not. So that's one um, drawback or uncertainty that still exists. Number two is integrating clinical and statistical considerations. We propose one conceptual framework, but this is based on our understanding of the literature and it's definitely not the be all end all. And there's still no guidance out there um, that suggests a, a, a robust method. Uh, number three is that there's no head-to-head -head simulation studies comparing these different statistical methods. Um, and a limitation of our scoping review is that it's just that, it's a scoping review. Um, the descriptions that we provide, our understanding of the strengths and limitations are based on what was reported by authors um, talking about their method or different methods relative to each other. So we cannot verify because this is not a clinical research study where we can conduct a risk of bias assessment and things like that. So in conclusion, what we need in the future are simulation studies to compare these statistical methods head on to kind of uh, decipher the statistical properties behind each one. But we also need methodological research uh, that looks at how to integrate statistical and clinical considerations to have a comprehensive non impurity margin. Uh, thank you. And that's a picture of my dog from being bored listening to me talk <laughs> about non impurity margins.